Hi, in this lesson, I'm going to discuss the unit one paper, January 2021 at Excel. Okay, the first one, the first question, a car is moving towards a stop sign at a speed of 25 meters per second. The driver applies the brakes 20 meters before the sign and decelerates uniformly to rest just before the sign. So they are giving four answers and the question, which of these uh, four is the correct deceleration? So the first part, first question I can use, V squared equal U squared plus 2AS. The car is coming to rest, so the final speed will be equal to zero. Initial speed, it was moving at 25 meter per second, so 25 squared plus 2 into A into the distance it moved before it comes to rest is 20. So A will be equal to minus 25 squared divided by 40 meter per second squared. This is the acceleration, but the question is deceleration. So when we say deceleration, it should be given in positive value. So the deceleration will be equal to 25 squared over 40 meter per second squared. The correct answer C. Question number one, the correct answer is C. Question number two, an object of mass 8.2 kilogram initially at rest falls a vertical distance of 25 meters through a air and has a final velocity of 20 meter per second. Which of the following gives the energy lost? So that means the energy dissipated means energy lost due to work done against drag force. So the question number two, an object which was at rest is released and falling through a height of uh, 25 meters when it falls that height the speed becomes uh, 20 meter per second and the mass is given 8.2 kilograms so with the, here we can use the correct equation energy equation it's falling down so it's losing the gravitational potential energy loss in gravitational potential energy equal Gain in kinetic energy plus work done against friction. I can say WF for the work done against friction. The question is work done against friction because energy dissipated. Energy dissipated in the form of sound and heat will be due to work done against friction. So loss in GP, MGH. Gain in kinetic energy will be final kinetic energy minus initial kinetic energy plus work against friction that's the energy dissipated so we know the quantities m is given as 8.2 into 9.81 into the height it falls is 25 half means 0 0.5 times 8.2 times the final speed 20 squared it was at rest so the initial kinetic energy is 0 plus wf so find the WF, make the WF subject, that is the work done against friction due to drag force. If AR they are saying, so AR means there is drag force. Due to drag force, work done against friction exists and there will be uh, energy dissipated in the form of sound and heat. So WF will be 8.2 into 9.81 into 25 minus 0 0.5 into 8.2 into 20 squared. So this format is given answer c the correct answer for question number two is c okay question number three the graph shows how the acceleration a of an object varies with time that is given this is the acceleration time graph so the question is which of the following graphs there are four graphs are given which of the following graphs show how the velocity v of the object varies with time okay so there we can see now, in this one, the first one, velocity is decreasing, but there is acceleration. When there is acceleration, the velocity should increase. It never decreases. Whenever there is deceleration, that means in case if they give the acceleration in a negative sign, that is opposite to the direction of velocity, then velocity can decrease. So, first answer is not acceptable because velocity is decreasing, but there is acceleration. Acceleration is increasing. That's a different story, but there is acceleration. So, velocity never decreases. The velocity will increase. So, this cannot be the answer. That's a wrong answer. Second one, velocity is increasing. 
right we'll see velocity is increasing velocity is increasing velocity is increasing in all these three velocity is increasing so one of these three is the correct answer but you should think like this acceleration is increasing you can see the acceleration is increasing with time different acceleration. So if i say a1 this is a2 a2 greater than a1 that means you know that the gradient or the slope of the velocity time graph gives the acceleration acceleration is increasing means the slope of the velocity time graph should increase velocity time graph the graph should increase at the same time its slope also should increase here the slope is decreasing if i draw the slope here and here the slope is decreasing so this cannot be the answer here it's a constant slope means constant acceleration so this also cannot be the answer so the correct answer here you can see the slope of the velocity time graph is increasing so correct answer d question number three the correct answer d okay question number four a student measures the time t taken for a ball bearing to fall different measured distances is from rest so the ball is the ball bearing is released from rest the student uses his measurements to plot a graph with a gradient equal to g so he wants to plot graph so the s is varied he is measuring the time taken to fall through the height s and he wants to plot a graph suitable graph such that the gradient becomes equal to g so what should be on y-axis and x-axis so there are four answers are given so which is the suitable uh, quantity on y-axis and x-axis so for that i can use downwards s equal ut plus half at squared so it's falling from rest so u equals zero plus half it's falling under gravity so g we are not considering the uh, drag force so the acceleration will be only due to the weight so gravity into t squared is it so here i can say 2s equal g t squared if i plot a graph this 2s on y axis and this if i take it as a gradient and this is x i will get a straight line y equal mx format where the gradient will be g so i should put i should uh, draw 2s on the y-axis and t squared on the x-axis correct answer b so question number four the correct answer is b okay question number five a student is investigating a material in the form of a wire which of the following properties of the wire will change if a longer wire is used first one breaking stress breaking stress does not depend on the length next one is density density of a material is constant it does not depend on the amount or the volume or the uh, dimension of it stiffness third answer stiffness stiffness means you know it indicates how much it could be deformed so when the length increases is it possible to deform more for the given force we'll check it so question number five I know the young model is equal stress over tensile stress over tensile strain. So stress is equal to force over area strain extension over original length. Okay. Young modulus is constant for a given type of material. We know that. That is a property of the material. It does not depend on the dimension. So I will make the delta x subject. So I can write this x goes up fx over a times delta, uh, sorry, a times delta x. So if we make the delta x subject, it shows fx over a e. That means for a given force, for a given area of cross section, for the given type of material. So f a e, if I keep it constant, and if I use a longer wire, initial length longer, then I'll get large extension that means deformation is more for a given force when the length increases that means the stiffness will decrease there is change in stiffness so question number five correct answer c question number five correct answer is c okay question number six they are saying two objects are traveling directly towards each other and then collide so the collision will be head-on collisions so object a is moving towards right 
the information is given the velocity 3 and the mass is 2 b is moving opposite direction mass 5 and velocity 2 the question they are giving four answers and the question is which of uh, which is the total momentum of a and b after collision so total momentum after collision means it should be same as total momentum before collision is it so we'll find the total momentum before collision b see i put it before collision if i find the total momentum that will be mass 2 into 3 i am taking towards right positive you know momentum is a vector quantity i am defining the motion towards right the momentum towards right is positive so 2 into 3 plus 5 into minus 2 because i am taking towards right positive so i am finding the total momentum before collision that will be 6 minus 10 it's going to be minus 4 kilogram meter per second towards right so it will be 4 kilogram meter per second towards left minus sign if i convert the direction it will be towards left 4 kilogram meter per second now i found the total momentum before collision that is 4 kilogram meter per second towards left according to the law of conservation of momentum it should be conserved is it so the final total momentum also must be the same 4 kilogram meter per second towards left after collision also so the correct answer a correct answer a for question number six okay question number seven a student determines the terminal velocity of a ball bearing as it falls through oil he releases the ball bearing at point v so the ball is released at the ball bearing at v and measures the time taken to fall it to for, uh, for it to fall a measured distance so we know normally we find the terminal velocity uh, we measure the distance between two points of its motion mostly we take the possibly the lowest position because we should give enough time for it to accelerate and reach the terminal speed is it so initially during its motion it will accelerate and the speed will increase when the speed increases drag force also will increase and at a particular speed the drag force will balance the total downward force so we need to give enough time and let it move through enough distance to reach the proper drag force and speed so you know the speed depends on uh, the drag force depends on the speed so it should reach a particular speed in order to balance the total downward force then only the resultant force will become equal to zero so there mostly we take the possibly the lowest two positions and we measure the distance from one point to the next point and we measure the time taken for it to move between those two points and find the terminal speed like distance over time right so here in this diagram if you ask me which points are the most suitable i will say y and z but in the answer y and z are not given so we should choose the suitable point so the answer says the first answer b and y second answer w and y third answer x and y and the fourth answer w and z so we should choose mostly the lowest positions the both should be the possibly lowest position so b and y completely not acceptable because b is above the water level so it's going to fall and accelerate so this is not the correct answer w and y w and y so y is at the lowest position but when it moves slightly below w also there's a chance it can accelerate so this point is little higher so it is also not acceptable x and y x and y we'll see it seems to be acceptable w and z again z is possibly lowest position but w is highest position so the ball will still accelerate even when it is slightly below w also so out of these four answers the most suitable is x to y x and y so this is the correct answer c is the correct answer for question number seven okay question number eight which of the following is a vector quantity density kinetic energy momentum and viscosity we know density is a scalar quantity energy any type of energy scalar quantity so kinetic energy also scalar quantity viscosity is a scalar quantity so the momentum is uh, vector quantity so question number eight the correct answer is c 
क्वेश्चन नंबर नाइन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट इज नॉट करेक्ट फॉर न्यूटन थर्ड लॉ पेयर ऑफ फोर्सेस सो दैट मीन समथिंग रिलेटेड टू प्रॉपर्टीज ऑफ थर्ड लॉ पेयर ऑफ फोर्सेस यू शुड रिमेंबर दोज प्रॉपर्टीज वट आर दे दे हैव द सेम मैग्निट्यूड दे आर द सेम टाइप ऑफ फोर्सेस दे ऑलवेज एक्ट फॉर द सेम टाइम पीरियड दे ऑलवेज एक्ट ऑन द सेम लाइन ऑफ एक्शन दे ऑलवेज एक्ट ऑन टू डिफरेंट ऑब्जेक्ट्स and always act in opposite direction to each other so these are the properties of third law pair of forces so which of the four answers not uh, the property of the third law pair first one they are saying the forces act in opposite direction yes it's a correct one so it's a property the question is not property so a is not our answer the forces act on same body yes that's a wrong statement so forces act on two different objects so question number 9 the answer which is not the property is b question number 9 answer b okay question number 10 i drew the diagram for the given question a locomotive pulls a train at constant speed against a force of 8400 kN so they are telling the force against that means they are giving the total resistive force a locomotive pulls a train at constant speed against a force of 8400 kN that means 8400 N is the total resistive force but it's moving at constant speed locomotive is pulling the train so resultant force must be zero because it's moving at constant speed no acceleration so the force exerted by the locomotive on the train also must be same as the total resistive force right because it's moving at constant speed so the force exerted by the locomotive on the train is 8400 kN so it's moving through a distance of 1 km at the constant speed and we know the useful power output of the locomotive 70 megawatts question is which of the following gives the time in seconds for the locomotive to pull the train a distance of 1 km so here i can say the force exerted by the locomotive also same as the friction because it's moving at constant speed so i can say work done by the locomotive that's the use work done by the locomotive is equal to its output power into time work done by the locomotive locomotive is doing work is equal to its useful power output into the time power into time is the energy right so force into distance is the work done by the locomotive is equal to power output into time the force exerted by the locomotive 8400 kN so 10 to the power 3 and the distance moved is 1 km so that is 1000 again 10 to the power 3 equal power output 70 megawatts mega 10 to the power 6 into t so t is equal to 8400 into 10 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 3 over 70 into 10 to the power 6 so i wrote it just the same format but the answers are given in different format so this is actually i can write this is 8400 as 8.4 into 10 to the power 3 So 10 to the power 3 into 10 to the power 3 will be 10 to the power 6. So I can say this 8.4 to 10 to the power 6 times this 10 to the power 3 comes again divided by 70 into 10 to the power 6. I can write 7 into 10 to the power 7. This is the time taken. So the correct answer is C. Question number 10. Correct answer C. Okay, question number eleven. A uniform plank of length four meter is pivoted zero point nine meter from one end. So from this end at zero point nine meter, that is the pivot. The weight of the plank is two hundred fifty newton. So it's a uniform plank. So the weight will act at the center. A person of weight nine fifty newton stands at one end of the plank. That is this person. A person of weight 650 newton, another person, he is standing here at a distance x from it, and the plank at horizontal position. Okay, first part add to the diagram to show the forces acting on the plank. So okay, now weight of these people will act on them. The weight of a person will act on his body. Since he is standing on a plank, he will exert a push on it. right so if i draw the free body force diagram for one of him 
and the plan if I draw, the weight of the person will act on him. Weight never acts on another object where you are standing, right? The weight of your body will act on you. You will exert a push on it. According to Newton's third law, the, uh, where you are standing, that surface will exert the third law pair, normal reaction on your body. If you are at rest, if you are at rest, then R will have a numerical value equal to weight. Your weight will act on your body. You will exert push on the surface you are standing on it. That surface will exert third law pair, the normal reaction on you. If you are at rest, then the numerical values of R and Mg must be the same because there is no resultant force. So the push exerted by you, this R equal Mg means this R and this R are same because Newton's third law pair of forces. So the force exerted by you on the plank will be equal to Mg if you are standing on a plank. Okay, so normally students, they say the weight of the person will act on the plank. That's a wrong statement. Weight of the person will act on the person. It won't act on another thing, another object. But weight of the person will act on the person. If the person is at rest, R must be equal to Mg. This R and this R are normally uh, Newton's third law pair of forces. So this will have a force, numerical value equal to weight of the person. So first part, add to the diagram to show the forces acting on the plank. Okay, so there we can say first the weight of the plank will act on the plank. That is 250 Newton and it's a uniform plank. So it will act at the center, 250 Newton. Now this person's weight will act on him. He is standing on the plank. He will exert a push and he is at rest. So the push exerted by the person on the plank will be equal to 950 Newton. Same way, this person also will exert push on it that also uh, act on the plank. That will be 650 Newton since he also at rest. Okay, so these are the forces and there is a normal reaction from the uh, this uh, support or the fulcrum to the plank that is R. I can call that R. Okay, these are the forces for the A part. B part, calculate the value of X. So we know the per plank is at rest and it's at horizontal position so according to principle of moment clockwise moment must be equal to anti-clockwise moment i'll take moment about this fulcrum or about that uh, pivot right so if i take the moment the total clockwise moment must be equal to total anti-clockwise moment about o so if i take it in clockwise direction the total moment must be equal to zero so total clockwise that will be 650 into this distance x plus 250. This is 2 because uniform plan 4. This is 2. This is 0.9. So that will be 2 minus 0 0.9 minus. This is anti-clockwise. This is clockwise. These two forces provide clockwise moment. When I take moment about O, the moment of R will be 0. So that won't come in my equation. So I'm taking moment about O. And the anti-clockwise moment will be 950 into 0 0.9, that's equal to 0 because it's at rest. Solve it, you will get the value for x. x will be equal to 0 0.89 meter. That's the answer for B part, question number 11. Okay, question number 12. A moving walkway are often found in airports. One moving walkway carries passengers up an inclined of 30 degrees. So along this way. So the diagram is given like this. A single passenger of mass 72 kilograms stands on the walkway. The speed of the walkway is 0 0.51 meter per second. Show that the rate at which the walkway does work on the passenger is about 200 megawatts. Okay, so the rate, I can do this in uh, two different methods. So I can say the first method, I can say like this, rate of work done by the walkway is equal to rate of gain in uh, gravitational potential energy because the passenger is not accelerating his speed is not changing so no change in kinetic energy so during one second so they ask about rate means per second during one second the passenger will move along the walkway 
along the walkway a distance of 0.51 meters. So the length he moved will be 0.51 meters during one second. So what will be the height he moved up? The vertical height he moved will be equal to 0.51 sine 30. Is it in this triangle? This is 30. So the 0.51 sine 30 is the vertical displacement during one second. So the power output, the useful power output, shows that the rate at which walkway does work on the passenger. That's a useful output, right? Power. So rate of work done, or you can say uh, rate of work done by the walkway. is equal to rate of gain in GP because his kinetic energy is not changing. So I can say rate of gain in rate of gain in sorry, gravitational potential energy, no change in kinetic energy. So rate of gain in gravitational potential energy. So that will be mgh where h is the height moved per second. We know the mass of the person that is given 72 kilograms, 72 into 9.81 into h, I can say 0 0.51 sine 30 during one second. So this is height per second, is it? So that will be per second. So if you solve it, you will get 180 joule per second or 180 watts. Approximately, we can say 200 joule per second or 200 watts. Okay, this is one method, right? We can do it by using the work done. So immediately students think work done means there should be force into distance, students things like that. Okay, if I think that way, force into distance, I'll do it here, the second method. So there I can say like this, the walkway should exert force on the passenger to pull him up. How much is the how what is the required minimum force? He is not accelerating. So the force opposing his upward motion is his weight, mg sine 30. That's the force try to pull him back, right? So to pull him up, the walkway should exert the same force because he is not accelerating. There is no resultant force. And if there is resultant force, he would have accelerated. His kinetic energy will increase. But here he is moving at constant speed. So this is the force, the component of the weight along the slope down. So the walkway should exert force on him that also same as mg sine 30. That's the force exerted by the walkway to raise him upward direction. So rate of work done, how much will it move along the plane up? It will move him along the plane every second, 0 0.51 meter, because he is moving at 0 0.51 meter. So here I can say rate of work done by the walkway. By the walkway. equal to force exerted by the walkway to pull him along the slope up into distance moved per second where d is the distance moved per second so the minimum force it need to apply is equal to his weight mg sine 30 into the distance along the plane per second will be 0 0.51 so here mass is 72 into 9.81 sine 30 into 0 0.51. Solve it, you will get the same answer, 180 joule per second, approximately 200 joule per second or 200 watts. Either way, you can answer here. The force calculus when get confused, how much is the force? That is same as his weight because he is moving at constant speed. Okay, B part, the walkway system has an efficiency of 78%. Calculate the power input to the system when 15 passengers of average mass 72. Early also, they said uh, part A also 72 kilograms. So here again, average mass 72 kilograms are standing on the walkway. So here we know the useful output power. We found it in the first part, that is 180 watts. 
So here the efficiency is given. So we know that the part efficiency equal useful output over input into 100%. Efficiency is given 78%. So 78 equal useful power when it is uh, lifting 1%, we found it 180. So here 15 identical passengers, so same mass. That, so that will be 180 into 50 over P input into 100. Solve it, you will get the input power. That will be uh, 3462 watts. If you give it in three significant figures, you can say 3.46 or 3,460 3, watts. Okay, the 13th question, a rugby player kicks a ball off, off the ground at an angle 35 degree to the horizontal. As shown, the ball reaches maximum height of five meters. So what is meant by maximum height? At that point, the vertical component of the velocity will be equal to zero right because it couldn't move beyond that so it's moving up up highest point means it's not further moving beyond that point so the vertical component pulls the ball up so at that point the vertical component of the velocity will be equal to zero so uh, show that the initial speed of the ball is about 70 meter per second so first of all, that is the a part so that's simple i can use vertically v squared equal u squared plus 2as from the initial point up to the highest point. So at the highest point, the vertical component is 0. Initial speed, I can say u sine 35 all in squared plus 2 into minus 9.81, negative 9.81. The reason I'm using upward direction, gravitational acceleration is downward. So minus into the maximum height is 5. Okay, solve it and find the U, you will get 17.3 meter per second. That's the answer for the A part. B part, after traveling a horizontal distance of 22 meter, the ball reaches the goal. So they are showing the goal post is given. The height of the goal post is 3 meters. So if you want to score a goal, the ball should move above 3 meters. So this is the ground, this is 3 meters. So the goal post is at a distance of 22 meters from the initial point. So the question is, uh, for this particular speed of kick, will the ball pass over the horizontal line, which is at the horizontal pole of the goal post, which is at a height of 3 meters. So the idea, I should find the height of the ball when its horizontal displacement is 22 meters, right? So B part, when the horizontal displacement becomes 22 meters, I am going to find the vertical displacement for that i should find the time taken to complete horizontal displacement of 22 meters so i'm using horizontally s equal ut plus half a t squared so 22 meters equals 17.3 cos 35 into t plus half so horizontally we don't consider the drag force there are no acceleration so horizontal acceleration will be equal to zero so t squared will not come in my equation anyway this multiplication will become zero so solve it and find the time you will get 1.58 seconds so for this particular time we will find the vertical displacement what will be the height of the ball during this time so Vertically, S equal ut plus half at squared. The height of the ball will be u is, uh, we can say the initial vertical component will be 17.3 sine 35 into 1.58 plus half into minus 9.81 into 1.58 squared. Find the height of the ball above the ground at this time that will be 3.16 meters that is greater than 3 meters so the ball will pass over this horizontal bar and 
he will score the goal right he will score the goal okay question 14 the photograph is given there uh, in which a fire boat is used to put uh, water uh, in horizontal at an angle okay so the pump fixed to the boat pumps water from the sea the sea water is projected at high speed out of a pipe connected to the pump so the mass of the sea water pumped each second is given 300 kilogram the pipe has a diameter 10 centimeter and the density of the sea water also given a part first part show that the speed at which sea water is projected from the pipe okay so here we can uh, write the equation say we can say like this we can say the length of water column pumped out every second will be equal to length of water column pumped out every second I'll call it as L length per second. What length of water column will come out to the pipe? Imagine this is the pipe. So the water is flowing. Imagine a surface which is at a particular instant coming out. During one second, what length that surface will move? That will move equal to the speed, is it? During one second, imagine this is the pipe. A surface of water is coming out. During one second, the surface which came out of it will move a distance that is equal to the speed so that will be equal to speed of the water i can call it as v so what's the volume of water pumped out per second volume of water pumped out per second or every second equal length of the water which came out into the area of cross section this area the area of cross section of the water column that is the volume of the water pumped out per second the mass of the water pumped out per second so that will be this is the volume of water pumped out per second into density of the water so that is the volume mass of water pumped out every second that is given mass of water pumped out per second is given in this question that is 300 kilograms length of water pumped out is actually equal to speed so i can replace this l by v the length of water pumped out per second is speed of the water at which it's coming out so that is the question so i don't know i need to find it so b that is the length per second length of water column coming out through the pipe per second area of cross section we know that area is given by pi r squared so pi the radius is given actually they are giving the diameter so radius will be half of it so that will be 5 into 10 to the power minus 2 all the squared converting centimeter to meter pi r squared into the density of water 1030 solve it you will get the the, the speed of the water that is 37.1 meter per second so b part determine the rate at which the momentum of the sea water is changed by the pump you may assume the water is initially stationary yeah so water was at rest initially so every second this mass of water is pumped out so this mass of water before it is pumped out is at rest so actually it's gaining momentum so increasing momentum or gaining momentum in momentum i can say delta p equal mv minus mu we consider for one second is it so we know that the question is determine the rate at which so rate so rate means increase in momentum per second that means rate right so mv mass we are considering per second so 300 
it pumped out at a speed of 37.1 minus 300 say mass when it is in C it's at rest into zero so you will solve it so you will get 11130 kilogram this is kilogram per second see the mass is kilogram per second because every kilogram per second so it's the mass per second times this is velocity meter per second see that it is kilogram meter s minus 2 that's a unit of it kilogram meter per second square you know this kilogram meter per second square is the unit of force in terms of base unit so actually what i found is the force exerted on water by the water pump okay that's the force we found it i can say 11130 kilogram meter per second square or i can say same thing in newton same answer with newton i can say that Okay, both are the same answer. Okay, so part C, sorry, uh, part B, projecting water from the pipe causes a force to be exerted on the pump. Explain the direction of the force on the pump. So we know that, so if I say this is the boat, and here is the uh, pump, it's exerting water this way. If the water is pumped this way at the speed what we calculated in the previous part, right? According to Newton's third law, if the force is exerted on water that is equal to uh, 11,130 Newton, the same force will be exerted on the pump in opposite direction according to Newton's third law. So the answer for Part B, projecting water from the pipe causes a force to be exerted on the pump. Explain the direction. So, explain means there's no big explanation. We can say according to Newton's third law, Newton's third law, the same magnitude of force magnitude of force will be exerted on the pump in opposite direction in opposite direction to the flow of water that's answer Okay, part C. Initially, the pump is turned off and the fireboat moves forward through the water at constant speed. So, they are saying constant speed. The boat's engine provides a constant forward force. When the pump is turned on, water is projected forwards and the fireboat slows to a lower constant speed. So, again, it's achieving a constant speed, but it's lower than the initial constant speed. Explain why the boat now has a lower constant speed. Your answer should refer to all the horizontal forces on the boat. Okay, so initially the boat was moving at a constant speed means uh, there will be forward thrust from the propellers. The engine will exert a forward thrust force. Since it's moving at constant speed, the drag force will be equal to forward thrust. So the forward thrust and the drag force will have the same numerical value. They will be in opposite direction and the boat has no resultant force. It's moving at a constant speed. So for example, just I'm taking an example. I'm not using the actual value, but we calculated earlier. So if the forward thrust is, for example, 20 Newton, I'm just using a numbers, 20 Newton, then the drag force also should be the same. Then the resultant force is zero. It will move at constant speed. Now, when you turn on the pump, water will be projected forward at a particular force. Say, for example, the force exerted on the water by the water pump is equal to, for example, 8 Newton. Just I'm taking numbers, 8 Newton. Then the water will exert same magnitude of force in opposite direction according to the third law that we explained on part B. 
So the same force will be exerted. I call it as F P, the push by the water. That also will be eight newton. This is the force acting on the water by the pump. Then water will exert opposite force to the pump. This direction, which is eight newton. The forward thrust will remain same as two hundred newton. Now look at here. At the moment you switch on the water pump, there will be forward thrust same as twenty newton. The drag force at that moment will be twenty newton. At the moment you switched on the water pump. It still remain twenty newton, but the what exerts a uh, opposite force eight newton. Now see what's happening. The total forward force is just twenty only, which was earlier balanced by the drag. Now when you switched on the pump, the drag is at that moment twenty newton. So the total opposite force is twenty eight. This is forward force is twenty. Total opposite force is twenty eight. So what will happen? The boat will have a resultant force at the moment you switch on the pump. At that moment, the boat will have a resultant force opposite to the direction of motion. The boat is moving to the right. We'll take it that way. So, what is pumped towards forward direction along the direction of velocity of the boat? The water also pumped. So, it's moving this way. Now, it has an unbalanced force to the left. That is how much? Eight newton. So what will happen? The boat will slow down. Boat will slow down. So when the boat slows down, what will happen? The velocity will decrease, and when the velocity decreases, the drag force also will decrease. Remember that the drag force, the drag force is always directly proportional to the speed, whether the fluid flow is laminar or turbulent, whatever it is. Higher the speed, greater the drag force. Lower the speed, lower the drag force. So what's going to happen? The boat is going to have a resultant force opposite to the direction of motion. The boat will slow down. When the boat slows down, these two forces remain the same. So when the boat slows down, the drag force will start to decrease. Right. So at a point, at a particular speed, the boat is slowing down. The drag force also decreases. At a particular speed, the total forward force will be balanced by the total backward force. This eight remains the same. This twenty remains the same. So the drag force, when it comes to twelve newton from twenty newton, now you can see the total backward force twelve plus eight twenty newton. Forward force also twenty. But boat has slowed down. Now it won't slow down further because it has no resultant force opposite to the direction of motion. Forces are balanced, so now it will move again at constant speed, which is lower than the initial constant speed. Okay, so that's the thing you need to explain in words. Okay, so this is the answer you should write. So initially there is no resultant force; it's moving at constant speed. When the boat is when the water pump is switched on, there will be opposing force. So it will slow down when it slow when the boat slows down. There will be uh, the drag force will decrease, and again the resultant force will become equal to zero. Then it will move at another constant speed. Okay. Okay, so before starting question fifteen, uh, we'll discuss something related to work and uh, gravitational potential energy. Say, for example, when we release a ball to fall down, so the ball has weight acting downwards. Imagine there are no other forces acting on it, and if I release it from rest u equals zero, when it falls through a certain height, its speed will become v. Normally. We write energy equation for this. So, what's the energy equation? Do we write loss in GPA? That is loss in gravitational potential energy equal gain in kinetic energy. Is it? That's the way we normally write loss in gravitational potential energy equal to gain in kinetic energy. But at the same time, we know the Earth is pulling or the planet is pulling the object down. So the object has force and it has fallen down through height h means we can write this loss in GPA in terms of work 
done by gravitational force. So the same equation I can write work done by the gravitational force gravitational force equal to gain in kinetic energy. So these two are the same loss in gravitational potential energy same as we can say work done by the gravitational force understand so work done by the gravitational force because gravity the earth is pulling the object and it's moving through distance h so work done by the gravitational force is mgh that we call loss in gravitational potential energy same way when we throw an object from ground in upward direction when we throw an object from ground in upward direction at a speed u when it reaches a particular height h during the motion there is a force acting in opposite direction to the velocity the motion is upward direction so here normally we write if the velocity becomes v we write normally loss in kinetic energy equal gain in gravitational potential energy so the same thing gaining gravitational potential energy this is loss in kinetic energy okay the same thing loss in kinetic energy equal to the instead of writing this way gain in gravitational potential energy i can write work done against the gravitational pull because it's moving upward the gravitational pull is downward so i can write work done in terms of work done if i write i can write this work done against gravitational force So, gaining gravitational potential energy could be written as the same meaning work done against gravitational force. So, because the work is, the force is exerted opposite to the direction of motion. Compare this like an object is moving, a trolley is moving to the right, initial speed is u, after moving a distance, its speed becomes v. So, the V is less than U, that means it's decelerating, or I can say it's losing its kinetic energy. And if there's a friction acting, we write here loss in kinetic energy equal work done against friction, is it? Loss in kinetic energy equal work done against friction. Why we use the word work done against friction? Because that force is acting opposite to the direction of motion. Same way, the weight is acting opposite to the direction of motion when you throw an object vertically upwards. So there we can say. Gaining gravitational potential energy is same as work done against gravitational force. Okay, we need these ideas for the question number 15. That's the reason I'm explaining this additional one. Okay, so here we can compare another example. A spring is attached to a trolley. Uh, imagine it's like a longer spring. It's can be, it could be compressed a lot. Imagine like that. If you throw the trolley towards left, if you push it, if you push it to the left, Initially, there's a speed when the trolley moves towards left, the spring will get compressed and it will oppose the motion. So we know the trolley will slow down because the, the spring will exert a force, the compressive force on the trolley opposite to the direction of motion. So we can draw the diagram, the trolley is moving to the left, the motion is to the left, but the spring is getting compressed and it will exert a tension or compressive force to the right compressive force to the right so the trolley will slow down so i can say v less than u during its motion and when it compresses the spring so here normally we write energy equation like this normally we write loss in kinetic energy equal elastic gain in elastic potential energy we write it as loss in kinetic energy equal gain in elastic potential energy we know the elastic pot potential energy uh, stored in a spring half f delta x delta x is the amount of compression or half k delta x square right either way we can write so normally we write loss in kinetic energy equal gain in elastic potential energy instead of writing this gain in elastic potential energy, i can write loss in kinetic energy equal work done against work done against compressive force. Com 
progressive force same meaning because when it is doing when the trolley is doing work against compressive force that work that will be stored in the spring in the form of elastic potential energy so i can write loss in kinetic energy equal gain in elastic potential energy or instead of writing gain in elastic potential energy i can write work done against compressive force same way if you are keeping the trolley this way at its natural length if you throw this trolley to the right what will happen the spring will extend so the trolley will move to the right and the tension, the spring will be stretched and the tension will be opposite to the direction of motion. So there also we can write loss in kinetic energy equal gain in elastic potential energy, right? When the spring extends, the tension will be opposite to the motion. So gain in elastic potential energy, there it will be written as work done against tension, work done against tension or tensile force. Okay, so... Either way, we can write gain in elastic potential energy or worked in against tensile force. Either way, we can write it. Okay, so question number 15. This diagram is given about bungee jumper. So, he's jumping and it's classified into three stages. First stage, he's falling under gravity. The rubber cord is not stretched. He's falling under gravity and the rubber cord is not stretched. So during that motion, what's happening is free fall, weight is acting on him. And the question is, in bungee jump, the bungee jumper falls from high platform while attached to an elastic cord. The cord is also attached to the platform. The cord slows the bungee jumper down so that he comes to rest before stretching, uh, before reaching the ground. The fall can be divided into three stages. Stage one, the jumper is free fall. Stage 2, the cord is stretching until the acceleration of the jumper becomes equal to 0. Stage 3, this one, is still falling down. The cord is kept stretched further, but finally he comes to rest. The question is, explain in terms of work done. So, they are not telling which force, work done by which force, it's not mentioned. So, wherever we get elastic potential energy, when we are writing in a normal way we say loss in kinetic energy equal uh, gain in gravitational potential energy or when we are falling loss in gp equal gain in k wherever we write in terms of potential energy we should write in terms of work done that's the only difference we have to approach here loss in gp instead of that we should write work done by the gravitational force so stage one so the answer should be about his kinetic energy how the kinetic energy of the bungee jumper is changing right that's the question explain in terms of work done how the kinetic energy of the bungee jumper changes during the three stages so we need to explain the kinetic energy how it is changing but we can't write in terms of potential energy whether elastic potential energy or in terms of gravitational potential energy we should not write we should write in terms of work done i already explained before starting the question 15 how to write potential energy in terms of work done so first during the stage one it's simple we can say when he is falling earth is pulling him so the weight is acting on him so work done by the gravitational force equal to gain in kinetic energy normally you write loss in gp equal gain in kinetic energy for the stage one but here don't write loss in gp because they ask you to write in terms of work done so work done by the gravitational force equal gain in kinetic energy for stage one stage two he is still falling but now the rubber cord he has fallen through the natural length of the rubber cord so from this point onwards the rubber cord is going to get stretched, but still he is falling down, is it? So when the rubber cord gets stretched, you know, if I draw the free body force diagram, so there's a weight, earlier the weight made him to fall freely and he gained a speed here, but now there is a tension. So we know he's going to slow down. He can fall down further, but there's a force acting opposite to the direction of motion. So he will not slow down, he will still accelerate, is it his kinetic energy will still increase but rate of increase will decrease because there's a force acting in opposite to direction of motion until the t becomes equal to mg he will have a downward resultant force 
his kinetic energy will increase because he will accelerate. So that's what they are saying. At this point, the acceleration becomes equal to zero, the stage two, at the end of the stage two, where T becomes equal to mg. Beyond it, he will not accelerate because T will become greater than mg beyond this one. So he will decelerate and lose kinetic energy. So doing the stage two from this point to this point, still he is going to accelerate, but the rate of increase of velocity will decrease. That means acceleration will decrease because tension is getting larger, larger, but still tension is less than mg during the stage two. Okay, but here the answer is not in terms of forces. We need to give it in terms of uh, work done and kinetic energy. So during the stage two, we can say, Work done by the gravitational force is there. Work done by the gravitational force equal to gain in kinetic energy plus work done against the tension. Understand? Because here, work done by the gravitational force equal to gain in kinetic energy. Here, work done by the gravitational force equal gain in kinetic energy plus work done against tensile force something like a opposing force, the tension. So there will be work done against tensile force. So because of that, what's happening? All the work done by the gravitational force will not be given in the form of kinetic energy. So the rate of increase of kinetic energy will decrease. It will increase, but at slower, slower rate. That is for the stage two. Work done by the gravitational force equal gain in kinetic energy plus work done against the tensile force of the rubber cord. Therefore, rate of increase of kinetic energy will decrease. Okay, that is for the stage two. Stage three, what's happening? Now the tension has become more than his weight. So he is going to decelerate. He is going to slow down, is it? But still the gravity is pulling him. So during the stage three, from this point to this point, this is a special case at this point, I'll come to that point. But during the motion from here to here, what's happening, he is slowing down. So there we can say, but still the gravity is pulling him. So we can say loss in kinetic energy plus work done by the gravitational force. Both are supporting him. Loss in kinetic energy plus work done against gravitational force, both will become equal to work done against the tension. Loss in kinetic, he's going to lose the kinetic energy because the tension has become greater than his weight. So he's going to slow down. When he slows down, he's going to lose his kinetic energy. At the same time, still Earth is pulling him. Earth is doing work on him. So work done by the gravitational force plus Loss in kinetic energy equal to work done against tensile force. Now, finally, at this stage, he is coming momentarily rest. So, no further kinetic energy. Kinetic energy has become zero only at that moment. There we can say all the loss in gravity, all the work done by the gravitational force, that is the loss in G, please. It actually all the work done by the gravitational force will become equal to work done against the tensile force. Actually, we write loss in GP at the last point. We have no kinetic energy. We will write loss in GP equal gain in elastic potential energy. That's the way we normally write. Loss in GP, this is the height through which he falls down. Loss in GP, no kinetic energy at that point. So speed is equal to zero. So at that point, normally we write loss in GP equal gain in elastic potential energy but we can't write in terms of elastic potential energy we need to write in terms of work done so we can say at the last point the lowest point kinetic energy is equal to zero because he is at rest so all the work done by the gravitational force will become equal to work done against the tensile force of the rubber cord Okay, so that should be the different. Nothing different, but only thing we are writing in terms of work done for potential energies.
Okay, question 16 about in solid materials. A steadily increasing tensile force was applied to a sample of titanium alloy. The sample had an original length of 40 centimeter and diameter of 5.05 millimeter. Say, state a suitable A part, state a suitable measuring instrument to measure the diameter. So, you know that that is micrometer screw gauge for the A part. B part, determine the young modulus of the sample. So, there you can see a small portion is straight line. You can keep your ruler and see on the graph, the given graph. So, up to that point, it's a straight line. So, that obeys Hooke's law. So, you know the young modulus for stress strain graph, the gradient of the linear portion gives the young modulus. So, find the gradient of the linear portion from your graph. So, that is the B part, uh, first part. Young modulus equal gradient of the linear portion. So take a suitable values from your graph. So I took it 600 into 10 to the power 6 minus 0. This is origin 0 divided by 0 0.005 minus 0. So the answer will be 1.2 10 to the power 11. Uh, Newton per meter square or Pascal. Okay, find the gradient of the linear portion. The sample broke at B. Determine the force required to break the sample. So this is the point where it breaks. So we need to find the force required to break the sample. We know that B part, second part. We know that breaking stress is equal to breaking force over area of cross section. Breaking stress, you can read it from the graph. At this point, the force will be equal to 1290 mega Pascal. That's the breaking stress. 1290 mega Pascal is equal to. I'm going to find the breaking force. I denote by Fb. Area of cross section, we need to find the diameter of the sample is given 5.05 millimeters. So find the area by using pi r squared. So convert the millimeter to meter pi into 2.525, the, the radius 10 to the power minus 3 holding squared. Find it from this, the breaking force, you will get it. That will be equal to 2.58. 10 to the power 4 Newton. Okay, third part. The graph is given, stress strain graph is given like this. So a graph through the straight line is given and the question is show that the area under this graph represents the work done per unit volume. So I need to find the area under the graph and show that it's work done per unit volume. So I can see area is equal to half, it's a triangle, half into base that is straight, we normally denote epsilon and stress that is equal to sigma. We know that strain is equal to extension over original length and stress is equal to force over area. Okay, so this I can write half F delta X over A times X. Half F delta X over A times X. A is the area of cross section. X is the initial length. So A into X is volume. But A into X equal volume of the sample. So that will be half F delta X. That will be work done or energy stored in it. Energy stored in the rubber, uh, sorry, in the wire or work done over A into X is volume. So that is work done per unit volume. So area gives work done per unit volume. Okay, question number 16, fourth part. Uh, 
the area under the stress strain graph represents the work done per unit volume estimate the amount of work required to break the titanium alloy so they have given a graph uh, with numerical values uh, so there we need to find the area under the graph is it so normally you count the number of boxes but here we are it's able to find it by using trapezium now you keep the rule and see up to which point the graph is straight line. So when I kept, I found this portion is straight line. So I took this trapezium. So I'm finding the area of this trapezium. So I'm finding the area of this trapezium. Then here also, this portion, if you keep a ruler here, this portion from this value, 1260 on the y-axis, this portion looks straight line. So I'm finding the area of this portion also by using trapezium equation. But this portion, this is a this graph is not a straight line it's curve. So I'm counting the number of squares, which consists of five tiny squares, small five squares. So the icon I found 25 small squares are not tiny squares a square which consists of 25 tiny squares one great right so that i found it so the area here it's a method there are different methods you can use it but the area under the graph is the energy per unit volume that is here i found 25 squares 25 into one square which consists of five tiny squares right so that is 0 0.005 into that's a value of one square 100 into 10 to the power 6 plus the area of this red color portion that is half into addition of the parallel side so this is 0 0.056 this length 0 0.056 minus 0 0.005 so that will be 0 0.051 into the vertical distance that is 600 into 10 to the power 6 plus area of this green color this one this uh, trapezium that will be half into addition of the parallel line this line and this line are parallel so 1280 plus uh, sorry 1280 minus 600 so this length means this is 1280 minus 600 so i need to find this length that is 680 plus this length this 660 into this length so that length will be equal to 0 0.026 into 10 to the power 6 so 10 to the power 6 for this side so i can put 0 uh, 10 to the power 6 here into 0 0.026 is this length, 0 0.026, this length, 0 0.026. Okay, solve it. You will get that is 62. 62 because this is in uh, mega Pascal. If I keep it in mega Pascal, right, you will get 62 mega joule per meter cube. That's the area under the graph. That is the energy per unit volume. The question is find the total energy. So we need to find the volume of the sample of the wire or sample that will be equal to pi r squared pi into 2.53 10 to the power minus 3 all things squared into the length is 40 centimeter, 40 into 10 to the power minus 2. That will be 8.04 10 to the power minus 6 meter cube. So what's the total energy required to break it? That is area into the volume. So the total energy required is energy per unit volume. That is 62 mega joule. 62 into 10 to the power 6 into the volume 8.04 10 to the power minus 6. So the total energy required is 498.5 joule. That's my answer.
Okay, question 17. A mass M is held in equilibrium by string attached to two clamp stands. A diagram is given there. There's force meter records of force F in the upper string. Okay, whatever they are giving it. So the question is, the force meter allow, allows force to be measured by means of Hooke's law. And they are giving the reading of the spring balance. You know, spring balance reads the tension applied to it. So there's a spring, it gets stretched. So it reads the tension on it. The tension is 15 Newton. And the extension of the spring of the spring balance is 8 centimeter. The question is, show that the stiffness of the spring. So that is nothing. K part of question 18. I can use F equal K delta X for the spring balance. We know the force acting on the spring balance. That is the reading of it, 15 Newton. K into the delta X is uh, 8 centimeter. So we are keeping it in centimeter because they asked to show K in terms of Newton per centimeter. So I'm not converting uh, delta X to meter. So I could keep it as 8. So the K will be 15 over 8. That will be 1.875. Newton per centimeter, so approximately 2 Newton per centimeter. Okay, B part. So they are given a diagram. So this is the actual symbol diagram I can draw. Here the Newton meter is attached. So that tension will be equal to 15 Newton, right? So, uh, okay, in the same situation, M is equal to 0 0.55 kilogram value of p is 8.5 so p means there's a horizontal string also there that p is uh, given that force is given as uh, 8.5 newton so it's attached to some support here is the object attached its mass is given uh, 0.55 kilogram and this force is the question we need to find the force on the uh, calculate the force uh, and the angle theta we need to find the theta and the force or the reading of the uh, string balance we need to find it so simple this question normally we do this type of question we'll resolve it vertically upwards it's at rest so vertical total force must be zero f sine theta this has no vertical component because you know when you resolve a vector through 90 degree, it won't have any component. So this 8.5 Newton won't have any vertical component. So if I resolve this, F sine theta minus 0 0.55 into 9.81, that's the weight equal to M0. So I know that F sine theta equal 0 0.55 into 9.81. Uh, we'll keep it as it is. Uh, equation 1. Same if I resolve horizontal direction. This force is already horizontal. This is vertical force has no horizontal component. So that will be 8.5 minus F cos theta equal 0. So F cos theta equal 8.5 second equation. Okay, I need to find the F and theta. So divide 1 by 2. F sine theta divided by F cos theta equal to 0 0.55 into 9.81 divided by 8.5. F and F get cancelled. Sine over cos will be tan theta. So tan theta will be equal to 0 0.635. So from that, find the theta. You will get the angle theta will be 32. Point degree. Now substitute this theta in one of the equations, you will get the F. So I'll substitute in the second equation. So from the second equation, if I substitute there, F cos 32.4 equal 8.5. So F will be equal to 5, uh, sorry, F will be equal to 10.1 Newton. The question is find the F, but also I need to find the extension of the spring. So I know the force acting on the 
spring of the spring valence, the tension of the spring valence will be 10.1 Newton. I need to find its extension. So I can use F equal K delta X for the spring of the spring balance. I know the F 10.1 K. We found it here 1.875 into delta X. This is Newton per centimeter. So when I solve, I'll get delta X in centimeters. So delta X will be 5.4 centimeters. Okay, question 18, the last question. A spherical polystyrene bead is immersed in oil. The bead has a diameter given 4 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter. So it's released from the bottom and it's moving up. So A part, they asked to draw the forces acting on it. One force is given, that is the up thrust. So other two forces, we need to draw the A part. This is the bead. So up thrust is given already. So the other two forces are weight acting downwards. I can show Mg. This normally we denote by capital U. And the other one is drag force. Fd. Right. B part showed that the upthrust the oil exerts on the bead is about 3.1 10 to the power minus 4. So we know that upthrust is equal to weight of the displaced oil according to the Archimedes principle. So weight of the displaced fluid is equal to volume of the displaced fluid. Since the bead is completely inside, volume of the displaced fluid will be equal to volume of the bead itself. So B, that's the volume of the displaced fluid, equal to volume of the bead into density of the oil into G. Volume of the bead is 4 by 3, it's a sphere, so 4 by 3, pi r cube. Diameter is given 4 into 10 to the power minus 3, so radius 2 into 10 to the power minus 3, all the cube into density of the oil is 930, and G is 9.81, so solve it, you'll get the after, that will be 3.06, 10 to the power minus 4 Newton, approximately uh, 3.1 10 to the power minus 4 Newton. Okay, C part. Stokes law shows how the viscous drag on a sphere is related to its velocity through a fluid. Stokes law is only valid if the bead is moving sufficiently slowly through the oil. Reason for that. Okay, careful about this. Now, you know the two conditions to use Stokes law. It should be the object should be a spherical shape object. The second one, it should be the laminar flow around the sphere. Okay, even if it is not laminar flow, even if the fluid flow is turbulent, drag force is directly proportional to the speed of the object. Even for any objects, mostly, generally, we can generally say the drag force increases when the speed of it increases. Whether the fluid flow around it is laminar or turbulent, we don't care. We can say the drag force increases when the speed around it, the fluid flow, increases. But only when, for spherical shape object, when, it, when the fluid flow is laminar, we have a special equation that is 6 pi eta rv because when the speed increases mostly the fluid flow will become turbulent then we can't use this specific equation but even if it is turbulent flow the drag force will be almost directly proportional to the speed okay so the question is state the reason why can't we use uh, why should it be a slower speed we can say the fluid flow around the uh, the spherical shape object must be laminar. You can say when the speed increases, the fluid flow will become turbulent. Then Stokes law cannot be used. Only when the fluid flow is laminar, we are able to use the Stokes law. Okay, the last part of this question, you know the Stokes, to apply Stokes law for a spherical shape object, the fluid flow around it should be laminar. If it is turbulent, you can't use. So, now they are giving the maximum speed to use the Stokes law. That means 
only at this speed. This is the maximum speed where for the given sphere of diameter in a particular fluid of viscosity, the fluid flow will be laminar. So this is the maximum speed, right? Beyond it, the speed, if the speed increases beyond this value, when we substitute the value of the viscosity, density of the fluid and the diameter of the sphere, okay, that's the maximum speed. We can use the uh, Stokes law, right? The question is, deduce whether Stokes law can be applied to this bead Viscosity of the oil is given, weight of the polystyrene bead is given. Okay, so we'll find what could be the maximum speed where we can apply the Stokes law, right? So the maximum speed by using this equation, I can substitute 10 times. The viscosity is given 4.90, 10 to the power minus 2 divided by the density 930 times. 4 into 10 to the power minus 3. So the maximum speed is 0 0.132 meter per second. So for this particular diameter of spherical shape object, when it moves in this particular fluid of density 930, the viscosity of this fluid is 4.90. This is the maximum speed where I can use the Stokes law. If the speed becomes more than this one, I can't use the Stokes law. So for this speed, this is the maximum speed I can use the Stokes law. So I'm going to find the maximum drag force for this sphere. Maximum drag force, I'm going to find it. So I can find the uh, maximum drag force will be 6 pi eta rv because I can't use Stokes law for this speed. This is the maximum speed. R is the maximum speed. So I'm using finding the maximum drag. So that will be 6 pi. The viscosity given 4.90. 10 to the power minus 2. The radius is uh, 2, into, 2 into 10 to the power minus 3. And the speed we found is 0 0.132. Okay, when we use this, we are getting the maximum drag force 2.44 into 10 to the power minus 4 Newton. So, if the drag force becomes more than this one, I can't use the uh, Stokes law. This is the maximum drag force for using the Stokes law for this particular uh, sphere. Right. Now, they are saying the can we use this equation, the Stokes law for this particular bead? Okay, we will find when the bead moves at terminal speed, it will have the maximum speed, is it? When the bead moves at terminal speed, it will have the maximum speed. So when it is moving at terminal speed, that is the maximum speed, we will find the maximum drag force, is it? The speed increases. When the speed increases, drag force also will increase, whether it is a laminar flow or turbulent flow, that is true. So when it reaches the terminal speed, the maximum drag force acting on the given bead, we can find it. So we'll find the maximum drag force at terminal speed. We can find like this. Uh, we can say this is the speed, it's moving upward direction. So this is the up plus, this is the weight of it. This is the drag force. So we can say at terminal speed, the bead will have the maximum drag. So at terminal speed, I can say U minus MG minus FD equal to 0. So up plus already we found it. The up plus is equal to, we found it, 3.06. 10 to the power minus 4. Weight is given. We know the weight of the polystyrene, 1.05. 10 to the power minus 5. So, we will find the drag force, which is maximum. We will get Fd maximum, that is equal to uh, 
2.96 10 to the power minus 4 newton now i can say now i don't want to find the speed here after finding the drag force i don't want to find the speed by using fd equal 6 pi eta rv because i am not sure whether can i use this equation for this drag force is it i'm not sure i can whether i can use or not i don't want to find the terminal the speed here because I am not sure whether I can use this equation for this particular drag force, but I can compare this drag force with the possible maximum drag force where I can use the Stokes law. The maximum drag force where I can use the Stokes law is this much. But for this particular bit, when it is at terminal speed, the drag force is 2.96, which is much larger than the maximum possible drag where I can use the Stokes law. So this larger force compared to this one clearly shows that the speed, when it is at terminal speed, the speed Vt is greater than Vr. The terminal speed of the bead is greater than Vr. That means I cannot use the Stokes law. I don't want to find the speed here by using 6 pi eta rv because it's actually not proper way because I am not sure whether can I use it or not. Is it that the equation is valid or not? We don't know. So no point of finding the numerical value. I don't want to find it. But I can say since the maximum drag of the actual drag of the bead is greater than the possible maximum drag where I can use the Stokes law. So that means here the speed is more because drag force increases, speed will increase. Or speed increases, drag force will increase. So this terminal speed is greater than the maximum possible speed where I can use the Stokes law. So actually for this speed, I can't use the Stokes law. Maybe before it reaches the terminal speed, I might be able to use it. Is it before it reaches the terminal speed, we might be able to use the Stokes law. But speed is increasing when it is coming up and up. So when the speed increases, the turbulent flow is occurring there. So initially we might be able to use, but for the complete motion, we can't use the Stokes law. Okay, that should be the conclusion. This speed is the terminal speed more than drag force. Okay, so that's the end of that paper. I hope you understood. Okay, bye.